Cool. So uh, I'll begin. Um, so I'm John Mason. I work for, for Broadcom. You know, if, if you read the description, then you know at least a little bit about me. Broadcom makes uh, a bunch of different crap. They're awesome stuff. <coughs> the best stuff, only the best stuff. We only make the best stuff. Um, so my group uh, makes SOCs um, for communications. Here's the marketing blurb. Um, you can read it or not. It's uh, marketing speak, so I'm not sure it's actually English. Um, and specifically, I work on what we call the North Star families of SOCs. It's, um, I don't know why we have two names, but it's also called Strategy X. It's part of the IPROC family, so if you're familiar with some of the, um, the wireless routers that are, are very popular, like, um, like I think that some of the ASUS ones are um, North Star based, which is uh, the 4708, 4709. Um, it's Cortex A9 without VFP because that apparently took up too much real estate, so you don't want that. Um, then we have the North Star Plus, which is essentially the same thing, only a little bit better, and it has Neon and VFP. And then our latest, greatest one is North Star 2, which is uh, Cortex A57 based, that's ARM V8, um, and is used all over the place. And if you want to buy some of them, just let us know and we'll probably sell them to you. Um, and then here's a, that was enough marketing for me for a little bit, so I thought I'd throw a little, little joke here. Huh? Okay. So if you don't know what a bootloader is, I'm not actually going <laughs> to kick you out. <laughs> um, so a bootloader, an extremely high level, is um, trying to put the system into a, a sane enough state where you can boot an OS. You know, you find the, the OS, cl clean up, um, load it into memory, and boot it. Um, you have this kind of level one versus level two. I don't want to get too deep into this because it's not uh, super pertinent to what I'm trying to, to show here. But the level one kind of puts it into the same state and finds the media, and then the level two actually boots it. Um, and U boot can do both. And uh, for our purposes, we do use it for both. Um, so, what is U boot? Um, it's actually called Das U boot. Um, my German is non-existent, so I'm sure I'm even pronouncing it wrong. Um, but Das U-Boot, the universal bootloader, I just call it U-Boot throughout. If, it, if you, want, you want to hear it um, called Das U-Boot, just whenever I say U-Boot, just put it in your head to say Das right in front of it. Um, and it's a GPL v2, which um, I think is actually pretty significant. Um, so U-Boot can boot from pretty much any kind of media or um, open file system including net, the network. So they've plumbed every single permutation I could think of, and uh, I looked and couldn't find anything I could actually even think of that wasn't possible. Um, so some alternatives for U-Boot. Um, the Core Boot, UEFI or UFI, the Tiano, Tiano Core. Um, so this is the kind of level one, level two kind of mashup because um, Tiano is not open, but Tiano Core is, and you can kind of mesh them together in interesting ways. Um, I don't want to talk about that too much, except for saying that it is a um, popular alternative. And um, just to be funny, um, Broadcom also has two internal bootloader competitors, um, because you know if you Google bootloaders, there's dozens and dozens for no real reason that I can find, except for everyone wants to do their own thing. Um, so we have CFE, or I think it's also pronounced CAFE, which is a Broadcom proprietary license. If you buy junk from us, apparently, it's not done by my group, so I can talk about it, uh, or I can't talk about it. But if you buy it from us, we'll license it back to you, and you, it's mostly used in these home routers, um, like the North Star based ones, um, and also MIPS for the set-top box group. And then there's Bolt, um, which is yet another internally developed one that's proprietary, um, primarily used for the set-top box group. So just, yeah, there's a lot. And um, in a perfect world, we'd all be using one. And uh, maybe one day we can get there. <clears throat> so um, this is the kind of bulk of, of it. It's how to enable new hardware in UP. <coughs> so a, an early. Uh, 2016, we got this board back. It's, this is the North Star 2 board. It's 
in all its glory. This is, of course, an SVK because you're not actually ever going to buy one of these. You're going to buy like the little processor with one or two things hanging off and a printer or a NAS or something like that. Um, but when we got it back, no one really cares that much about running U-Boot. They, they, they even only kind of care about running Linux because they want to run their benchmarks. So essentially, you want to get the, the goal of the first one is to get out of the way, to get Linux up and running as quickly as possible so that your management is not making you work weekends and, you know, until midnight every night. Be because you are essentially are gating all the other kernel developers, the device driver developers, anyone doing diagnostics, every single person around you is waiting on you to finish so that they can do their job, which, which is not a fun place to be. So you want to be out of that hot path as quickly as possible, or at least I want it to be. So step one is you need to get memory working. Um, without memory, like, you got nothing, right? Um, so you, you have RAM files. Um, your RAM needs to be knitted and, and set up. We luckily um, had a quick uh, hack around it is because we had a, a fairly large SRAM built into the, to the SOC. So we were able to kind of bypass this and run all from SRAM. Um, I've also been told that if you have a large enough L2 cache, you can actually rejigger that um, to act as a temporary RAM and fit, and you can hack down um, the bootloader to fit into there. Um, so that is kind of, that's kind of nice if you can get it, but if not, then, then you do have to go through. Um, we've actually had to follow one SOC that had, that did not have enough SRAM, and y you do have to go through and set up all this fun stuff, and it is, it is not fun. Um, <clears throat> And this is the uh, step two is getting the serial working. Because um, without anything going to screen, how do you know that you're booting or bricked or whatever? You actually need something. But there is a, um, a fun backdoor. If, if you can get a JTAG hooked up, you actually can um, look. There is an internal print log in both U-Boot and the kernel, if, if you don't have it working, where you can actually see um, what has been printed. Or it should have made it to screen but didn't because the serial's misconfigured or the serial driver's broken because you have a piece of serial that is difficult to digest. Um, and then step three, get networking boot, uh, get networking working. That doesn't sound like a very good uh, run there. But if you can get um, the kernel net booted, you essentially are out of the hot path. Um, and you're, but you might, uh, you're going to need um, the Ethernet driver and the Ethernet phi. You might be lucky enough from a previous generation of SOC to have those already kind of laying around or maybe minor modifications. Um, ours required more than minor modifications. Um, but there's also a secondary way. Um, if you have PCI and something like a Intel NIC, you actually can use that to TFTP boot and kind of sidestep any issues that you might have there. <clears throat> but what if you don't have Ethernet or Ethernet's not working on the A0 or you have some kind of restriction in your lab where you can't do any TFTP or you can't have a server running or there's no network or, or whatever. So at least on our chips, you can actually actually program the spy via JTAG, which um, saves you a lot of, of foot traffic. Or you can um, use a spy flasher and have a, um, a removable spy chip and flash and move and flash and move and flash and move. And um, that gets really tedious very, very quickly. Um, and similarly, um, if your SOC, um, if you want to be able to reflash your SOC, um, you actually can do, can do the same thing, but you actually need to have the drivers in U boot in place. Um, so you, sorry, that didn't come out right. So your, your SOC is most likely able to boot from NAND or SPY, but you need to have the drivers already implemented in U boot. So getting that done as soon as possible actually will save you a lot of this foot traffic, which is the well-worn well footpath here. And then kind of lastly, you want to, or not lastly, um, 
you, you want to get the other peripherals running. Uh, and then finally, diagnostics. Um, you want to have something that can actually test your hardware. Um, kind of similar to x86 BIOS post, um, U-Boot has this functionality that's actually pretty, uh, pretty well done. And you might also have a marketing requirement or a um, requirement of, other, of a customer to have something stress test your hardware, but they don't want to do it in Linux because of various reasons of Linux being more, uh, having more things running in the background. You want to see what the theoretical max of the, the hardware and things like that. So you can actually run those um, inside U-Boot. But a bit of caution here. Um, you can easily overflow the partition that you've set aside in NAND or SPY for U-Boot if you don't size it appropriately or you have a very constrained um, amount of space, uh, which can be kind of confusing because it doesn't show up until you try to boot the secondary things like your um, like Linux or you might over overwrite the end of it and therefore you don't boot at all. Um, it did bite us more than once. Okay, and how to upstream U-Boot. So um, this is the part where I'm kind of a poser. Um, I apologize for that. Um, so I wasn't able to push out my patches for, for, um, for U-Boot until last week, and therefore they haven't really been reviewed. So um, this is kind of going to be hand-waving, so I apologize for that. Um, so step one is to sign up for the mailing list because the mailing list is moderated. Um, this did bite me when I did submit um, because I submitted on Friday afternoon. And if you are not a subscriber to the list, your patches um, wait until someone approves it. And if you do it on Friday, no one comes to work on the weekend, then on Monday, your patches will finally hit the mailing list. And if Monday's a holiday, then maybe, or everyone's traveling to ELC, then maybe they don't get reviewed until maybe after this presentation. <laughs> um, so if you get ahead of this and subscribe early, then you avoid the stupid human error that I encountered. Um, so the upstream approach that I am taking that um, seems to flow with what I've seen on the mailing lists is kind of following the Linux mantra of push early, push often, kind of push small pieces. I've seen actually a lot of full um, entire system supports, but um, I think that might get a lot more review eyes to push something quick and get it in easy. Um, so the kind of Linux model of pushing small, easy reviews patches, um, each patch containing a logical change, that seems to be universal. And uh, running a check patch, that seems to be, especially internal to my team, a, a bone of contention that shouldn't be necessary. Check patch, there is check patch just in U-Boot just like there is in Linux. There's git maintainers in U-Boot just like there is in Linux. That should be pretty obvious if you have a Linux developer coming to U-Boot to do those things. Um, and if you can somehow get this in place internally, you can avoid a lot of, of pain. Um, unfortunately, we did not have it. Um, I think this is out of order. So, unfortunately for us, there wasn't a huge amount of customer demand for upstreaming U-Boot. We, we got a lot of customer demand for upstreaming Linux and getting the patches we had out of tree, in tree, and all that. But we, ha we had no customer saying that it would be fantastic or beneficial to, to upstream U-Boot. So the real benefit is what you have to sell to management, that by upstreaming it, you do have superior code quality you have the ability to cut a software development kit on the newer version of U-Boot almost at will. Um, if you have multiple, like a family of SOCs, you have to kind of convince them that you don't want to make every single U-Boot a snapshot. You don't want North Star Plus on a four-year-old version of U-Boot, North Star 2 on the latest one, and then in four years when we do the next one, 
to be a newer one. You, you want to be in the newer version. It's less maintenance for everyone to, to have everyone on the same um, release. <laughs> and they're actually, uh, so I've heard customers that actually do want everything running on the latest version. And there is the possibility, maybe faults or a specter, that you might sell more chips if you have the enablement upstream. Um, but if they don't agree, um, then you have to upstream after the fact, which is what we're doing. Um, so you have this kind of problem of having something on the order of 100,000 lines of code, many, some of which is completely unnecessary, that you need to upstream. So step one is, is to rebase. And if you're lucky and your code is elegant, you could just do a git rebase of whatever you have to the latest RC, which was RC2 as of Friday. And it might just magically work. Uh, unfortunately for us, it did not just magically work. It blew up in new and interesting ways and hacking it to compile cleanly and then it didn't boot and it's, it's a nightmare. Um, so I took option B here is to start from scratch. Um, it might be difficult to get your management to agree or you could just not tell them. <laughs> um, some management managers are very hands off and they might be amenable to that. Um, and then step two is squash. I don't think anyone, that, and I could be wrong, you people correct me, I don't think anyone cares about your thousands of revisions of, of an AND driver. They want one version, the latest version for when you push the initial version. Um, so squash, get squash is, or get, get rebase, you can use it to squash, it's fantastic. Um, I highly recommend it. And then uh, carving it into submittable chunks. Um, this is the approach I'm taking. Hopefully it is the correct one of just doing the basic enablement, to, taking the mantra of going small and growing it, just doing the part that enables serial, def config, the header files, and the board file. Then making it intelligent and adding the device tree um, awareness and then carving each individual driver into a separate patch. Um, and then a note to myself to add the basics of how to do that. Sorry about that. Um, and then finally, uh, DAGs and anything else. Um, for some reason, some companies think that this is propri proprietary. Um, unfortunately, it is not. If you've shipped out, and again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. But if you've released this to a customer or somehow otherwise distributed it, these things are statically compiled together. You've, you, you are obligated by the GPL to give away this code. It is no longer proprietary. Um, so, yeah. That might also be something to make your management aware of before they start shipping products. Not, they might want to do an um, audit of all the things they think is proprietary and making sure that they don't want to hand it out. And then submit and rework. Um, this is kind of the open source model. You submit something, repair it until everyone's happy with it, and then it goes away, and then you move on to the next thing. Do it serially. Don't submit 40 drivers at once, and then try to do them all at once. They're all going to have probably the same kind of problems. Um, you know, re re reinventing the printf seems to be a popular one, or adding delays for no reason. Um, so f submitting it serially and then fixing the same problem in, from the first one into the subsequent one pieces is, is very vital. I think I just blew through that. So hopefully everyone has lots of questions or we can uh, go over this patch right now. <laughs> so questions, comments? Yes, you're talking in uh, uh, tomorrow? On, on, uh, on Thursday. Thursday. So I'm saying is um, I'm basically going to explain the differences between those two. But in a nutshell, um, do we find specific 
application problem is similar, it's basically on the same layer as Careful you have a really bit of SQL and some chunks on top. Um, Tiano 4 is just a reference implementation from Intel for UEFI. <coughs> oh. Uh, Tiano Core is just the reference implementation for, UE, for the UEFI specification um, from Intel, and none of these require ACPI. Yes. So we actually have a good chunk of servers right now that are running uh, based on either Tiano Core or even AMI firmware that implements the UEFI specification and is running full device tree. Yeah, and so it's all fully supported and works fine. Yeah, so the, the, I think the, the, it's called the interesting part to me. It is the the kind of level one, level two thing, because my understanding of Tiana Core, and I could be completely off base here, is that you have the kind of basic, what we would call BIOS in the, in the old days, basic firmware, which does the setup, that then launches into the level two, which is the Tiana Core. Is that, am I misunderstanding that, or is that not true? In, in you would speech, you're basically talking about SPL and, and the main okay. chunk, right? So Tiano Core does not contain an SPL part. But we also have platforms in U-Boot which do not contain an SPL part, but require some other firmware to do that for us. Like, like an ATF? Like an a ATF sometimes does not include DRAM initialization code either. Okay. So it, if it was as easy, I mean, people wouldn't get it wrong, <laughs> um, right? It's, it's complicated. Um, but in, in a nutshell, it's the same thing, just not invented here. Yeah. And for the people that might not be following, um, there, there is this kind of handoff I, where, you, where you have level one that hands off to level two, and then you boot, you actually can do, I think your talk is actually talking about it, being able to f go from U boot to UEFI and, and then boot to the OS, right? I'm not going to do my talk at this moment, <laughs> <laughs> but basically, um, basically you, uh, you can extend U-Boot with the interfaces that allow you to implement the UEFI specification okay. so that you can run an, a payload and U-Boot in parallel at the same time. Um, and the payload can then call back into U-Boot uh, to basically implement its drivers, mm -hmm. right. um, which is what you use to implement a bootloader, like a, a graphical bootloader, not U-Boot, which is more like a firmware in yes. the traditional PC sense of the word. Yes, exactly. Um, so, and uh, actually on, on the ACPI thing again, um, there's technically nothing that would keep you from passing ACPI tables to a payload inside of U-Boot either. So if you wanted to, I don't see why anybody would, but if you wanted to, you could even teach U-Boot how to boot a Linux kernel with ACPI tables now. Mm -hmm. Um, if you really like to shoot yourself in, in the foot. <laughs> <coughs> um, another remark uh, to like where, where you talk about upstreaming things. Um, one thing that people keep forgetting, um, which is very, very, very important, is make sure your patches are always rebasable, which means every single commit inside your patch set has to compile throughout. So if you, if you, for example, add a dependency from one driver to another, just by like a link de linking dependency, make sure that you, for example, only allow that driver to ever be compiled with a kconfig entry after every connection is already there. Because otherwise, if you do a git bisect on something different, mm -hmm. you might end up getting a dependency included for some reason, one, one reason or another, and then your whole code base just doesn't compile anymore while you're trying to find out a bug for a completely different board. Right. So make sure that everything's fully bisectable. Um, those were the two. I don't know, Tom, did you have any? Thanks. So the, the question was, what is the preferred method to interrupt the boot process before booting the kernel? Yes. Um, I mean, there obviously is a timeout that, that you can do. Um, I, I think the default of just hitting enter or space works is within the, the escape timeout. key or the enter key? I mean, what's the... Yeah. Space, space, space okay. Space. Yeah. All right. Five or six seconds. All right. And you can enter user crowd, like MAC address or something like that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any key. Or any key. <laughs> yes. Hit the any key. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, with CFE, it's control C. 
Um, the patches that you're submitting for uh, U-Boot, are they for North Star, North Star Plus, or North Star 2? So what I'm submitting right now is North Star 2. Okay. Um, someone already did an, it's called an alpha version of North Star Plus. It doesn't actually boot. Um, That's not I, usable. <laughs> I, I think I figured out why while doing this patch. Um, so I... Um, I personally would like to try to steal time for management to allow me to upstream um, North Star Plus and North Star. Um, but kind of how earlier I said, um, you really don't want to do a snapshot in time of U-Boot and then walk away from it and have each SOC on its own. So we have that. So we have 2012 dot, let's say 10. I don't remember what exactly what release for North Star and North Star Plus. And then we have, um, well, luckily we had, we had a semi-new version, 2016-05 for North Star 2. Um, so, okay. And, One other quick question, and that is, mm -hmm. um, Broadcom is a very difficult company to work with. I don't know about working for, but working <laughs> with them is very difficult. Um, none of their data sheets actually tell you what family a particular processor is actually in. Um, so sometimes I'm not sure if it's North Star, North Star Plus, North Star 2. Do you have any quick tips on that? So if you can, uh, see, is there an easy way? Sorry. I think this is faster than just, uh, so um, you could key off the, the, those names. Um, yeah, because they'll say strategy X and, it's, yeah. and you don't know what it is. Um, but the, the stock names, the 5301, two, three, four, one. I mean, the secondary numbers, the, the skew numbers, vary pretty, pretty drastically, but, but the, the cores are pretty much the same. Okay. Uh, another question, but I'll ask you later because it's Broadcom related. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Unless there are no more questions. <laughs> uh, off the record kind of question? Okay. <laughs> yes. On your uh, one of your early slides about um, what uh, uh, what peripherals you're bringing up, uh, I would strongly encourage uh, anybody that's that's porting you to a new platform, really scan through your IP. It's chances are pretty good that one of those um, you know one of those peripherals is using shared IP that there's already driver yes. support for. Uh, excellent In point. particular, USB and USB on the go mm -hmm. tend to be pretty widely shared. Yes, uh, agreed. Thank you. Going once, twice, sold. Cool. Well, I appreciate everyone taking the time. And, uh,